I'll say good morning, everyone, for joining our latest installment of Compass Coffee Talk. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join uh, my co-host, Bill Capsalis, and I as we host some really amazing people today. We're very honored that our guests include Pam Shepard, the Managing Director of Manatree Partners, and we're going to learn more about how they are investing in nutrition and health and helping promote regenerative food systems that help support that. And also, um, who's been called the Erin Brockovich of the natural products industry, author of The Unhealthy Truth, co-founder of Replant Capital, a colleague and friend, Robin O'Brien. Uh, very happy to host both of you folks here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Good to see you. Steve, do you want to run us through our uh, thank yous and then we'll get a little quick intro from each of our guests? I will. Well, if you've tuned into our show before, we keep it short and sweet over a, a cup of coffee and a conversation. Um, but I do want to thank our sponsors, which include a very interesting um, baking and bread company out of the UK that's coming to America called Genius Food. A genius gut love and bread delivers a host of health benefits, including prebiotics and fiber and provide artisan upgrades to everyday breakfast uh, and all kinds of meals. Look for them at Sprouts uh, market stores nationwide. Allegro Coffee, uh, where your coffee comes from matters. Allegro brand has been around since 1977. You can find them at Whole Foods. Um, our friends at Presence Marketing, Dynamic Presence, one of the largest independent natural products sales brokerage firms in the country. We love the folks there and they represent a lot of great products. And then uh, Bill, you are executive director of Naturally Boulder. We appreciate actually that the Naturally Network um, um, satellites, including the original Naturally Boulder and also Naturally San Diego, are supporting our efforts at Compass Coffee Talk uh, with a sponsorship. So, you know, with that, I'd like to get us off and rolling. Um, our guests, I'd like them to, you know, basically give us a little bit of backgrounds about themselves and how uh, their work ties them into this theme of uh, regenerative food systems that we think can create uh, better environments, uh, be an answer to climate change, uh, and also support um, community health, local economies, and perhaps uh, an emerging green economy. With all that, um, Pam, would you start us off a little bit of your background, please? Sure, good morning, and, and thank you so much for having me. First, I, I want to say that uh, I, I love being here with Robin. Uh, she is a, 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 you know, a professional and personal um, woman that I, I greatly admire in the space. So, um, what, what a great, what a great uh, panel for me to get to attend. Um, so I'm Pam Shepard. I'm a managing director with Manatree Partners. We're a private equity fund located up in Vail, Colorado. And our investment thesis is improving human health and nutrition. Um, we are, uh, we approach investments from a health forward perspective, but as we all know, that's, um, you know, intimately related to um, the environment and to a social um, you know, environmental, social, and, and governance issues. They're all interrelated to health. We call it ESG plus H here at Manatree. Um, and that's how we, that's our lens on investments. Hey, Pam, how long, how long have you been with Manatree, Pam? Yeah, so I've been here just over a year. I joined in June of last year. Uh, so I just had my, my one year anniversary and we've, we've completed uh, six investments to date. Uh, we've got wow. th three more to go in fund one um, and we're already looking forward to fund two. Awesome. You've been busy, it sounds like. Yeah, we have been uh, and yeah. supporting really great companies. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, Robin, Robin, Robin O'Brien, who is also inspirational to me, even though I'm of the other side of the sex uh, spectrum. I, I love strong, powerful women like Robin. Robin, tell us a little <laughs> bit about you. And you could probably go on for an hour. So just, you know, whatever is, whatever works for you in the, in the in minute or so we have. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm with Pam. It's so much fun that you guys thought to pull us together because I'm a huge fan of what Manatree is doing, Ellie and Pam, and the remarkable team that they've assembled there. I'm very, very grateful for that work. 
Um, as you mentioned, I'm a co-founder of Replant with Don Schaefer, who was CEO of RSF Social Finance for 10 years, and Dave Haynes, who was Managing Director at Greenmont Capital. Three of us came together and we really saw an opportunity to provide solutions that are addressing not only this transition finance opportunity on the farm, because 80% of consumers are looking for something organic. 75% of categories in the grocery store now carry something organic but only 1% of our supply chain is organic. So in order for Manatree and other companies to succeed, the supply chain has to build out so that we can have economies of scale there and we can make this affordable and accessible to all who want it. So at Replant, that's exactly what we're doing. We are providing 2 billion in capital over the next 10 years to farmers to transition their farmland. It's an extraordinary opportunity. And what has been phenomenal is the, the response by companies, large and small, from companies that are carving out in the plant-based category to some of the largest multinationals, to some of the world's largest B Corp certified farms, to really work with them to transition their supply chains to regenerative and organic agriculture so that the math works for the companies that are putting these products on the table. What is actually really exciting about the work in transitioning these supply chains is we're actually decarbonizing them because as we transition practices on farm to these better soil health practices, soil then serves a stronger capacity to serve as this carbon sink to draw down the carbon from the atmosphere. That story for the multinationals and for the tiny companies is a phenomenal one to tell. And so we are really uniquely positioned right now with this opportunity to create win-win. And that's such an exciting story to tell. It's an amazing story to have partners around the table. So I appreciate everybody on the panel. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. the crazy story example is the demand for organic corn is so high in, in, among American consumers. U.S. farmers aren't growing enough organic corn. Suppliers are having to go to countries like Romania to source organic corn. No offense against Romania, but that's a lot of carbon getting the corn. Well, that's it. you're exactly right, you know, exactly. Because in the conversations that we've had with Applegate, you know, they've made a commitment to non-GMO. They were trying to source non-GMO. And I said, well, where are you getting it from? Because we're not clearly growing enough here in the United States for you guys. And she said, we're sourcing from Uruguay, Russia, uh, Romania, Australia, you know, and again, I thought this is an opportunity for American farmers. This is an opportunity to build the U.S. farm economy so that we are actually growing what the American consumers want to eat. And to put the farmer first financially in that equation, it absolutely helps expand the supply chain and address the challenges that we're all facing. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up supply chain, Robin, and you did it early on, which is perfect. Um, we did have a question for both of you about the pandemic and the supply chain. I don't know, Pam, have you seen any of your investable companies or invested companies having trouble with supply chain over the last 15 months? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you know, from getting glass bottles um, over the ocean uh, all the way to, um, you, know, in, you know, inflation and good costs that we're seeing right now. So, yes. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing, Robin, you, you too have seen this with farmers, right? I mean, the regenerative supply chain, as Steve just pointed out, has, has been tough. Um, is there anything that you can think of going forward, either of you, that, that you see on the horizon that's going to improve that supply chain situation? Or do you see it continuing to get worse? Or how, how does it stabilize over time? I don't know. Robin, do you want to address that? I mean, yeah, absolutely, because food security is national security. And right now in this country, we're growing food we don't want. You know, we're growing genetically engineered corn and we're growing genetically engineered soy and the consumer's asking for organic, the consumer's asking for free from. So we've got to transition our supply chain to grow the food that consumers actually want to eat. And that's in this partnership with these multinational food companies who are saying, we understand now that this 21st century consumer she knows what's going on. She's looking for transparency. It's driven from, by the health of her family and the concern that she has for the health of her children. Everything that Pam and Ellie are doing at Manatree, it's exactly that. So we are on the back end of that behind the scenes addressing the supply chain. And so to work with the growers that are inside of these multinationals to help them transition, whether that is equipment financing, if it's the expansion of acreage, if it's operational, if it's technical assistance, what do the farmers actually need to transition their supply chain? When you step back from this a little bit, this agrochemical model that was embraced into the US agricultural system over the last 20 or 30 years that led to just record use of pesticides and, and insecticides and record use of genetically engineered crops has trashed the soil. And the farmers are now standing on their land saying, you know, there's no legacy here with the soil that we're standing on. So how do we actually regenerate the soil that we're standing on in a way that 
the next generation of, of children in that family actually want to step into farming. And so when you look at that, that, that use of chemical application on farm, that use of genetically engineered crops on farm completely parallels the debt levels on farm. And so U.S. farmers now carry $426 billion in debt. I cannot imagine asking any other entrepreneur to carry the level of debt that we ask our farmers to carry. It is absolutely unthinkable. And so to look at that and say, as you transition to regenerative agriculture, you see an immediate cost savings in the reduction of chemical applications. We've worked with farmers in Indiana who have transitioned 7,000 acres from conventional corn and soy and genetically engineered in the portfolio of chemicals to regenerative. And in the first year alone, they've seen half a million dollars in cost savings. That is impact. That is impact investing. That is supply That's chain money. management at its core. That's yeah. real money. And both of you are at the nexus of money right now related to this issue. Pam, I'm curious about, um, you know, the investment picture that you guys look at uh, at Monetary, but also, you know, what is happening with money right now related to this? It seems like there's more money coming into it. Are you both seeing that? Without a doubt. I mean, you know, Robin, Robin has referred to it several times. The consumers are demanding this. So where the consumers are, the, you know, the, the, the investment groups are following and, and are, are trying to support these businesses who are focused on regenerative agri agricultural practices from and full and uh, full supply chain transparency. There's a there's a pull, um, you know, from all from all sources to make this happen in our country. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know how much money is flowing into re Regen right now, and do you have any sense of it? I don't. I don't know if I've ever seen a number. I don't have a stat. I know that Robin's a little closer to the industry. To, to, the, yeah. to that. No, but you know what? My, my, answer, my answer to this would uh, be that you've got educated capital coming in and you've got uneducated capital coming in. Okay. And uneducated capital coming in is extremely dangerous because okay. they simplify this and the nuances and the level of um, knowledge that's required as you navigate this is complex. And so really, you know, what we're working to do is identify what, what's the educated capital that's coming in that is truly collaborative versus uneducated capital that is coming in and being very kind of paternalistic and dictatorial on what you're actually supposed to do without an understanding. And what we see sometimes is that there is real arrogance in that ignorance. Yeah. Um, are you guys open for taking a question from uh, some of our viewers? Is Interesting question in the chat about what role does technology have to drive supply chain transparency around regenerative and are companies in the supply chain ready to embrace transparency? It's our investment mandate to uh, to ensure that, that we have full supply chain transparency. So to receive an investment from Manatree, we trace that all the way back to the source. So uh, I think yes, uh, without a doubt. Okay. Now, do you help your portfolio companies in that regard or it's like a requirement and you they got to show you what they've accomplished or is it a little um, of both? It's a little of both. So, you know, we need to know what it is and then it's how can we improve it over time? Mm -hmm. You know, my question. Well, yeah, I'll answer too for that because, you know, for us, transparency is critical to the model. Absolutely 100% critical. And as we structure loan terms, you know, the, the relationship also involves these technical assistance providers, which are third party providers that can verify that data with the kind of transparency and accuracy to ensure the longevity of this, because it's not in anybody's best interest to try to, to game it or greenwash it or, you know, the term that I think of now is carbon washing. You know, we're going to have a lot of people coming in and carbon washing this and making these promises that they're not going to be able to actually fulfill. So transparency to us is critical. It always has been. You guys know me. It's always been part of part of my values. Definitely. Yeah. You know, also, I think uh, and this gets to a question I wanted to segue to Pam. I mean, you're coming from human nutrition and health. So the transparency there is important in nutritional ingredients and now you're adding this element of regenerative uh, production uh, methods to it why why is that important to you in, in nutrition i mean it, it's important globally uh, for our for, for for food safety i mean as as the population grows and grows and grows we we have to correct this problem <laughs> uh there'll be no food left or no ground to grow it on so we we uh, need to address it um, in the, you know, and it needs to be, it's brick by brick, right? I'm not saying that uh, one company, every single ingredient is going to be sourced through regenerative ag practices here in the United States. It's brick by brick. It's switch out one ingredient, focus on buying from those small farms, 
it's brick by brick by brick, and then eventually the house is built, and it gets big, you know, it, it, and then it, it, it amplifies that way. Hmm. You know, Rob, I go beyond. I, yeah, I would say I would add to that that not only is it imperative for the products and the crops that are coming off the farm and out of the soil, but again, we have failed to recognize over the last several years the powerful role that soil plays as a climate solution, its ability to hold carbon and store it as a carbon sink. So as we regenerate the health of the soil, we're actually regenerating soil's capacity to serve as that carbon sink. And I think, you know, when we've sat down with scientists, I said, did we miss this? Like, how, why are we only now just having this conversation about soil as a carbon sink? And they said, really, the science in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years has just been groundbreaking. So once you know better, you can do better. And that's really the opportunity in front of all of us. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's just getting that chemical aircraft carrier to turn around because they're <laughs> wanting to keep going in that same direction and they don't, they don't turn on a dime. But meanwhile, you know, the, the, uh, the smaller craft of regenerative, we love that you're supporting them. How, how, um, I mean, you, Robin, you work kind of directly with the farmers. How do they best work with you? We do work directly with the farmers. We put the farmers first in our model. Um, you know, up until this point, the farmers have not been put first. They've been treated as sort of these hired indentured servants. Um, and that that treatment has, has corroded our food system in ways I think that are beyond most people's capacity to imagine. Because what has happened is the legacy of farming in America is dying and young people don't wanna step into this as a career and a profession. The reason for that is because financially, it doesn't make a lot of sense to carry that level of debt, to be in a model where you're spraying agrochemicals all around your children. So the younger generation is saying, you know, we're not up for this unless something fundamentally changes. So in the conversations that we've had with the farmers, we put them first and we meet them where they are. And if a farmer has been farming conventionally, you know, for the last 10, 20, 30 years to sit down and actually listen to what their needs are, what their financial needs are, what their needs are culturally, to understand how passive aggressive the bullying can be on farm for some of these guys when they begin to talk about considering the shift towards regenerative or organic. And so for us, it's an economic argument to simply say, financially, this is in the best interest of your, of your family to break this addiction with these chemicals because it's also gonna help reduce your debt level. We bring in technical assistance providers and that's region by region and crop by crop. That's not us in Boulder. That's not half the team in Oakland. These are guys on the ground that work with rice growers in Arkansas, or they work with barley growers in North Dakota, or they work with dairy farmers in Ohio and Kansas. And those technical assistance providers speak that specific language to help those farmers and those growers transition. And we're there behind the scenes to meet the financial needs that they would have in that transition process. Wow. Pam, I would ask the same uh, question. Amazing. You work with companies that are adding value so how, how did, I mean, what's kind of your sweet spot or how a company would work best with you? Mm -hmm. You know, Robin and I uh, are, in our, where we're investing is, is just, it's, it's adjacent to each other. And when you think about mandatory and when we're very health forward, so we look at health first and our lens is always health, you know, only 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy. That's another huge crisis in this country wow. um, that needs that needs to be corrected. And so when we look at investments, we look at how we can um, bring better calories <laughs> uh, to these consumers, make them help them make better choices, and support the businesses that are doing that. So that's that's our lens, and that's how we look at companies. Got it. Wow. We uh, we I, had a question come in through the uh, through the Q and A, uh, you guys, about investing in emerging hemp hemp fiber, grain, and carbon sequestration, given that the administration is focusing on climate, soil, sustainability, disruption, and new ag, and beginning you know, to, to help farmers. Um, yeah, do either of you want to address that sort of question about hemp and, uh, uh, hemp and where the hemp industry is going? Yeah, I mean, I can say, you know, we, we absolutely are in conversations at this intersection of food and fiber. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is the crop rotation that occurs on farm. So if you're working with, for example, peanut growers in Georgia, they're rotating those crops with cotton. So how you treat the cotton on farm is how you're treating the soil of that farm, which then that soil is what you're putting the peanut plants into. So it's absolutely all connected. Mm -hmm. The other thing we're seeing are these coalitions and collectives that are that are forming, you know, really working food industry and fiber and apparel. 
Um, so really that intersection and thinking about this as this total system is critically important. To touch on something that Pam touched on earlier is they focus on health, you know, and they're talking about how 12% of the population, only 12% of us are metabolically healthy. When we talk about the microbiome and we're really comfortable talking about our own microbiome, you know, we have all the probiotic market and everything that's exploded. The focus we have is the microbiome of the soil. And as you're tackling the microbiome of the soil, it doesn't matter what crop, hemp, cotton, mm -hmm. soy, who, you know, oats, whatever you're putting into that soil, it's the microbiome of the soil. So for us, as you build that microbiome, whatever crop, whatever category that begins to emerge is healthier and better off for it. Nice. nice. Um, another question came in through the chat, very active chat today. How are you pricing regenerative grains? With farms executing transparency, are you able to guide farmers in the massive investment of certification? So question about, I guess, uh, the supply chain and, and supporting the farmers. Um, I see Robin nodding and Pam is nodding also. Are you both kind of actively involved in helping those farmers with that? Pam, you want to take it? Okay. No, you can take that one. I'm sure you're yeah. much closer than I am. <laughs> yeah, so yes, we, we definitely are. I think one of the challenges, which is also one of the opportunities in Regenerative right now, is that it doesn't have a codified definition. So USDA organic by law has a legal definition. We are not yet there with Regenerative. So right now there's a little bit of a danger zone of sort of saying, is it going to be the new natural, which as we all know, stands for who knows what. So, you know, the opportunity now within regenerative mm. is to actually define regenerative. And as we've worked with different companies and different growers, you know, there are potato growers that are saying, this is how we're going to define regenerative potato farming. You talk to berry farmers who haven't actually thought about how they're going to define it. And that's the opportunity. How do you actually define regenerative berry farming? So as we do that, you know, again, it's putting the financial interest of the farmer first. That is our North Star and that is our compass. And so as we put the financial interest of the farmer first, Reduction of chemical inputs is, is critical. So, you know, we see that immediately building soil health and measuring it. So the metrics matter because if you don't count, it doesn't matter. So we can be on farm saying, you know, what are the metrics in soil? We're talking about water conservation. We're talking about water infiltration. Some of the work that we're doing in the Central Valley in California, converting almond orchards to regenerative almond growing, you know, we're seeing a 500% increase in water infiltration. Those are tangible, real metrics. And as we capture those metrics, you know, to be able to offer stronger, better terms to the farmer in terms of loans. And then also, I think what is important, and it is a lesson that we have learned in the food industry around genetically engineered foods, is that there is a lot that you can do at the state level. So we are working with ag secretaries at the state level who are trying to provide the right incentives to state farmers to transition to regenerative agriculture because of the impact on things like water conservation and water infiltration. So it's really kind of looking at it as a total system and how we can wrap around the farmer to help facilitate and assist in that transition. Yeah. Do you feel that there is a regenerative certification needed? There is one out there um, mm -hmm. that's trying to gain some traction. ROC, regenerative, regenerative organic certified. Companies like Patagonia, Dr. Bronner's, yeah. Rodale yeah. Institute have got behind. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those companies are certainly on the vanguard of this and I think are excellent role models. Other role models, I'm curious as to your perspectives, Pan and Robin, when I see like Pepsi Co, speaking of potatoes, commit 70,000 acres to regenerative. I think that's a good thing because if we don't get these big companies doing it, I, I mean, again, only 1% of land in America is organic. So we have to have the big push, but does that mean it's authentic or are they whitewashing to some extent? Yeah. So I would I would answer that and say, you know, there's a company McCain Foods, um, the woman that runs sustainability there is absolutely brilliant and incredibly high integrity. And, um, you know, as we've worked with her over the last couple of years, um, you know, to understand with transparency and a high level of integrity, how they are defining regenerative potato growing. Again, I think it gets back to your earlier point about transparency here. How transparent are the multinationals willing to be? It's why we're really thrilled about the partnership with Danone because they're B Corp certified. And basically what they're saying is we recognize that it's not just the shareholders here, that we've got multiple stakeholders in the system. And as, as farmers themselves begin to transition to that B Corp certification, which I think is an absolutely powerful 
powerful shift that is happening. Again, it gives the farmers that latitude that they need to make this transition. Nice. Um, you know what? We got we got only a few minutes left here, but I love this question from Tom Braun in the chat room. Um, what can the average consumer do to support regenerative agriculture? I want to I want to hear Pam answer this. What can the average consumer do, Pam? Educate themselves. I think first and foremost is educate themselves, and then demand it. Demand it from the from the food they're eating, from from the from the grocery stores where they're buying the food. You know, demand that it that their food is grown in in this way. Yeah. Yeah, good one. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we did have a question about women in this field and and your two strong, powerful women in this field. Women seem to be leading the charge here right now. Is that um, obvious to you guys or is it uh, kind of you know, exciting to see or do you just move forward and don't care about that right now? You're just doing what you're doing because it's the right thing to do. Uh, I'll jump. Uh, you know, I think I, I think, you know, when you consider the influence that women have on household purchases, um, you consider the understanding of um, the multi generational impact, you consider the understanding of how we modify and adjust our diets during pregnancy. Um, it absolutely and intuitively makes sense that women are leading on this. What I would like to see is more women in governance because, you know, while we understand this at the consumer level and absolutely we're leading this at the consumer level. And one thing that I would add, you know, that consumers can do is express gratitude to the brands that are actually meeting your needs. Reinforce, reinforce them with gratitude and positivity that you are very appreciative of the work that they are doing because that matters too. That gratitude really pays it forward. Um, but you know, I, I would, I would, I would also argue that um, we talk so much about biodiversity in the food system. We talk so much about biodiversity on farm. That diversity in leadership and governance is critical for this to be successful. Yeah, I agree. Pam, do you have any thoughts on that um, question of women leading the way here? I think uh, Robin hit it. Or it's intuitive to us, um, without a doubt. It, there, there, it's you know there's this thing called women's intuition, which we've all heard about for centuries, and it, it absolutely applies here um, wholeheartedly. Agree. Um, yes, you know we're running out of time here. I know Pam, you have a hard stop here. And we want to be respectful of that, and and uh, the half hour has almost flown by for me. Steve, do you want to uh, ask any final questions of our panelists? You, you know, I'll out to all those folks emerging from the the pandemic of the past year what's the environment look like for you out there the challenge and the opportunity in our quick one minute round and pam would you start that yeah, off yeah so so um i, I think that uh, uh Health was a big factor in COVID. <laughs> People's health was, and as it turns out, it was a, a bigger factor than COVID than, than actually the virus. Uh, and I think consumers are waking up and becoming aware of that, and realizing what changes can I make long term that are sustainable, um, you know, for myself and you know, and for the environment. Stuff the natural products industry has been talking about for a hundred years. Suddenly, Without the relationship doubt. between yeah. diet and help and boosting yep. your immunity Section, yep. made a real connection in this past year. And what I'm hearing is that will have lasting effects going forward, which is good for Manatry as you promote human health and nutrition. So thank oh, you so awesome. much. Robin, last round for you. What's the environment looking like challenge-wise and opportunity-wise for companies, farmers, producers going forward? You know, I think the silver lining of this last year and a half with the pandemic and COVID is that it showed us how fragile our food system is and how vulnerable we are to disruptions. If you think back to last summer when there were shortages on grocery store shelves and Costco was rationing how much you could actually purchase in different categories. We never experienced that before as a country and it really showed us how vulnerable we are to a system that has been designed with a lot of flaws in it. So the opportunity is to bring transparency to that system, to create a system that is much more direct between the farmer and the consumer. And I think, you know, the way that the consumers can support that is really supporting the brands that are truly, truly supporting their farmers. What's been fascinating for us to learn over the last year and a half is which of these companies actually know their supply chains and know the growers in the supply chains 
and which of the companies really just know ADM and Cargill. And that's an invitation to all of us to put that farmer forward so that we can support and meet the needs of the US farm economy. Because as I said earlier, food security is national security and national security is food security. Got it. So to me, regenerative is taking the, the um, taking organic and adding consideration of carbon in the soil. They're, they're very complementary, synergistic, and those kinds of practices can really support family farmers, small producers, all the way on up to large companies and get the chemicals out of our environment. So thank you both for supporting that financially because without the capital, there's no sustainability, there's no regeneration. Let's hope we continue to co-create a, vir a virtuous circle uh, to save our planet, our society, our farmers, our economy. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. It was Thank great you. to talk with you both. Thanks All so right. much. You all have a great day. Stay cool on this hottest day of the year in Colorado. Wishing you all well. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.